it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. And while you're not physically here at All Nations with us, I'm telling you, it's just good to worship together. The Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, they were on one, in one place on one accord. And I believe that where you are right now, we are all on one accord waiting for a move of God. So I welcome you in, All Nations and all of our streaming friends and visitors. Come in and see what the Lord is about to do. I know that there's a life-changing word just for you. It has your name on it. It's tailor-made just for you. So I know that God is going to do something big, something great, something awesome, something mind-blowing. And I'm so grateful that you can join in and share with us. So I ask you to like and share this video. Amen. That someone else may be blessed by the word and by the worship. Come on, let's praise the Lord together in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Good morning, all nations. We're going to give God praise. Come on, continue to give God glory. Come on, let's set an atmosphere that's conducive to a move of God. Let's set an atmosphere that God can reign. He can move. He can work miracles. He can work signs and wonders. Come on, lift up your voice and shout hallelujah. Come on, let's give a great shout to hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, you're worthy. God, we magnify you and we speak well of your name. Come on, begin to speak well of the Lord.
Jesus, we declare that you reign. We declare that your name, it still works. It has all power. It has all authority. So this morning, we're going to stand and we're going to proclaim that your name has power. Glory to Jesus. Can we lift up our hands in worship now? Come on, begin to lift up your hands right where you are. There is no greater name than Jesus. Jesus. Is there is a name that's a place I can run and be safe. There is a name that can heal, come my storms, peace be still. I can call on that name and be saved. Cause things will change, yes they will. So I'll stand and proclaim. There is no greater name yeah. than Jesus. Yes, so than Jesus, hallelujah. So I'll stand and proclaim there is no greater name than Jesus. Nobody but you, Jesus. So there is a name, say. There is a name. Come on, say it. That's a name. Yeah. I can run and be saved. And be saved. There
Somebody ought to lift your hands wherever you are and begin to uplift the name of Jesus. He's an awesome God. He's a wonderful Savior, and we bless Him, and we glorify Him, and we honor Him, for He is great and mighty and greatly to be praised. Oh, God, we bless you. Oh, God, we lift you. Oh, God, we thank you. Come on, somebody just release the name of Jesus. Come on, release the name of Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Open your mouth, open your mouth, open your mouth. Come on, let's release his name. Release his name. Jesus, tremble at the name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. We need you. We need you. We need you, Jesus. Oh, we need you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, lift up your hands and open your mouth and release the name. Stand and proclaim There is 
no other name than Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We bless his name today. We give him glory today. Hallelujah. He is an amazing God. He's a wonderful, wonderful Savior. Listen, I'm so excited this morning while we're in the presence of God to come into your homes, to come on your job, wherever you are, and to release the word of the Lord as our praise team have paved the way for the word. I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter number 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to, to glory and virtue, whereby are, are, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. So far, the scriptures. For a few minutes this morning, I want to talk to you from the subject, and it's in question form, what else do I need? What else <clears throat> do I need? Uh, when we consider the terminology need, and we think about Need it, it speaks of that which is necessary uh, as it relates to any type of setting, any type of plan, journey, voyage, any vision. What I need is all inclusive of that which is substantial and that which is non negotiable. Uh, as you uh, look at our subject and we talk about what else do I need, it's an indicator that I already have something that is necessary, but what else do I need in addition to that main thing? It's like going to the grocery store and considering uh, cooking a certain type of meal and you, you, you get your entree and you get your salad and you get your sides and even perhaps you pick out your dessert and you think to yourself, what else do I need in order to make this meal substantial? Well, within the context of our conversation this morning, I want to talk about what else do I need in terms of my salvation. Uh, I believe that um, preaching to some people this morning and that there are many of you watching that you're very serious about your relationship with God and you're very serious about your soul salvation. And the question that we must entertain today is what all 
do I need to be saved and what all do I need to stay saved in this critical hour where there, is, there are problems and pandemic all over our land. There's civil unrest. There's social unrest. And, of course, we're dealing with the ever-present scare of the COVID-19. The saints, it is time for us to rise up and declare that we're going to be all that God has called us to be. But in order for us to do that, we have to consider what all do we need. When we study our scripture text this morning, uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1, it is a very, very intense chapter. Uh, it's very, very, very um, intense because Peter is not writing to ancient day believers. He is writing to believers, period. When you study the salutations and the greetings of 2 Peter chapter 1, you will find that he addresses this particular letter uh, to those who have obtained precious faith uh, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So he's writing to current day believers within his time and he's writing to those believers that will come on the scene later. Peter is writing a prophetic letter. It's not like the letters of Paul because the letters of Paul were written to certain genres of people and certain groups of people like the, like the letter to the church of Galatia or the letter to the church of Corinth or the letter to the church of Ephesus or the Philippian letter. No, Peter is writing a letter to all believers and there is a sense of urgency in the tonology of his letter. Uh, he deals with the knowledge of God. He deals with the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. He deals with, with solidifying your salvation as a believer. Peter here is arguing that although the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ is the nucleus of our salvation, that it is not the essence of our salvation as it relates to all that we need. Let me just argue here that if you are saved, it was your faith in the Lord Jesus that got you on the journey. It was not how loud you shouted. Uh, it was not how hard you cried. It was simply your conviction in your heart of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 10. He says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When you study this uh, scripture more intensely, you will find that Peter begins to make reference to the power of God. Because when you deal with the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't leave out the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is what solidifies your salvation, brings you into covenant relationship with God, and then gives you power to live a godly life. He deals with the power of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Holy Ghost in the church is what makes us relative to God. It is regenerating power. It is transforming power. It is saving power. So not only do I need to be convinced of the efficacy of who Jesus is, I also need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me just tell you something for those watching me, that the Holy Ghost is not goosebumps. Uh, that the Holy Ghost is not a good, uh, uh, a happy feeling of euphoria that you get from the presence of God. But the Bible teaches us in the book of Acts that every time the Holy Ghost fell, that they spake 
with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Let me tell you something. If you really have been filled with the Holy Ghost, nobody will have to tell you. You'll know it for yourself. I wonder, do I have somebody watching me this morning that will declare, I got it like the Bible says. I remember the day and the very hour that he filled me with the Holy Ghost power. Now I understand that I have the faith of the Lord Jesus and I have the Holy Ghost. What else do I need? That is the question. It's not rhetorical. It is informational because now we have to go on a scavenger hunt to understand that there is something deeper than where we are right now. If you're going to stand in these last and evil days, you're going to have to have something else in your grocery cart. Not just uh, your ground beef. You're going to have to have some cheese. Y'all ain't going to help me here. Not just your cheese. You're going to have to have a salad. You got to add something to what you're already have and if you're not adding anything can I argue with you that you don't have everything you need you don't have it you don't have it so let me just go on to say here he says according in verse number three as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness so look at Peter here now he's being theologically facetious to let us know that there is no life outside of God I know there are a lot of people in the church getting caught up into the world. There are a lot of people in the church trying to act like the world. There are a lot of people in the church trying to fit in with the world. But I wish you would tell somebody, newsflash, there is no life outside of God. There may be vitality, but there will be no zoe. Zoe is the thing that, that distinguishes the living from the dead. And may I suggest to you that in this hour that we're living in, I believe that we're on the cusp of the rapture of the church where Jesus Christ is getting ready to, to snatch the church out of the world and I believe that in this time there is a line of demarcation where Jesus is distinguishing the true believers from the performing believers oh yeah a lot of people can say his name a lot of people can act like they know him a lot of people can act like they got the Holy Ghost but the thing that's going to prove what you got is how are you living I wish you would tell somebody I am convinced that there is no life outside of God and what are you saying if you're on the line or if you are hanging in the balance or if you are in the valley of decision trying to find out if you're going to live this God life or if you're going to live the worldly life you hadn't made up your mind yet the real saints will declare I was lost but now I'm found I was blind but now I see and the reason why I can see is because now I know that there is no life outside of God I thought I was doing something in the club but I wasn't doing nothing I thought I was doing something in that hotel room I thought I was having fun when I was sleeping with some other woman's man but I wasn't having no fun there's no life outside of God I wish I had a Holy Ghost filled believer that will declare this joy that I have the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away and so he says watch this in verse number four whereby are given unto us exceeding and great exceeding great and precious promises somebody ought to say I have promises that means I have promises with an s why now watch this that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust now notice here that Peter begins to say that by the power of God and by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ you have been given exceeding great and precious promises being saved is not boring being saved is not a life that calls you into having nothing Nothing, winning nothing, obtaining nothing. There are precious promises, not just a promise. Uh, we focus on the promise, which is eternal life. But there are promises. That means I have an inheritance. That means that he has given me something.
something to look forward to. I feel like talking to you now. He has given you authority. He has promised you peace. He has promised you victory. He has promised you wealth and riches. I want to talk to a believer that will declare I'm not going to live less than what he promised me. He didn't promise me uh, to keep on getting drunk. He didn't promise me to keep on getting high. He, he didn't promise me to keep dodging the police because I got weed in my car. He, he didn't promise me to have to keep hiding my phone because I got two and three girlfriends. He promised me. He gave me great promises. And when you understand that living for God is a privilege, you'll take your promises. Who in here will declare, I want my promises. I want my inheritance. I suffered long enough. I cried long enough. I had nightmares long enough. Now, I want my promises. I want to drive in peace. I want to sleep in peace. I want to talk in peace. I'm not hiding from anybody. I want my promises with an S. But notice he says, we escaped. Now, that's the part that got me. We escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust is destroying marriages. Lust is destroying ministries. Lust is killing a lot of people's businesses, their future. Lust is hindering our potential. Lust is damaging our reputation. Lust is killing our legacy. Lust. And let me tell you something. The deception of lust is the fact that it's not going to last forever. It's vanity anyway. All those people, all these men that think they look so handsome and these women that think they look so good and all the lust that is matriculating in the atmosphere. Let me tell you something. The stuff that's standing up one day is going to be bowing down. Uh huh. And the stuff that used to stand up is not going to get up anymore. Men, I need you to understand. You're wasting your time on something that ain't gonna last anyway and I believe I'm preaching to seven people in here that will declare I don't want anything that's not good for my future hallelujah hallelujah how many of you in your house will declare I spent some time on lust and it feels good but it doesn't pay well Oh, God, soul tie after soul tie, brokenness after brokenness, having to go to the health clinic to check my blood to see if I contracted a disease. Lust is painful, baby. Preach words. I'm doing the best I can. Lust, lust, lust. And the devil laughs at you because when you're on the Lord's side and you're letting lust run your life, people are looking at you like, you ain't for real. You just playing. Oh, God, aren't you glad that God knows your heart? I wish I had a praiser to understand that sometimes while you're in your process of overcoming your lust, God will cover you. God will look out for you. God will protect you because he's preserving your calling. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to lay hands on yourself and say he preserved my call while I was trying to find myself. Oh, y'all don't know when to praise him here. No go side. He, he preserved my call while I was messing up. He preserved me and he covered me because lust tried to get me. But Peter said, we escaped. And if I escape, that means something was chasing me that tried to get me. Y'all don't know when to shout. How many will give God praise that you escaped? Now listen, I got to move. What else do I need? Somebody just shrug your shoulders and say, what else do I need? What else? What else do I need? We, we're living in a generation uh, of, of believers that say this to themselves. They say, I believe in the Lord Jesus that all, that's all I need. But I come to suggest to you, that's not all you need. Look at what Peter said uh, in verse number five. 
And beside this, beside what? Beside the power of the Holy Ghost. And beside the faith of the Lord Jesus. This is what Peter said. Beside this giving all diligence. Peter says this is urgent. This is urgent ladies and gentlemen. Give all diligence. Do all you can to add to your faith virtue. Now, there are seven things that you got to add. Number one is, I'm going to need to be moral. That's what virtue is in the text. When you look it up in its Greek etymology, it means moral excellence. Add to the Holy Ghost. Add to my faith in the Lord Jesus. Virtue. Moral excellence. Now, if he's telling me to add it, everything I'm about to say to you is my responsibility. He says, I gave you the Holy Ghost. I died for you. Now, this is your job. Add to your faith moral excellence. Uh, add, add uh, moral excellence. What is an example of moral excellence? Cleanliness. Stay away from perversion. Stay away from that pornography. Watch this. Moral excellence is also acts of kindness, uh, acts of service. Serve in the community. Serve the church. Serve your family. Give. Pray. Add moral excellence. Add faithfulness. Add reliability. Add accountability. Add moral excellence. Be a person that takes care of your body. Be a person that rests well. Be a person that is careful about the words that you release out of your mouth. Add moral excellence. You got the Holy Ghost. You got Jesus. Now add more excellence. That's number one. Number two, he says, and beside uh, faith, add virtue, and to virtue, add knowledge. Now, I want you to understand that these are all in chronological order. This, this text is not a melting pot of a lot of different principles that he just puts in and jumbles up. This is the, this is the order in which you are to add these things. They are sequential. He says, add to patience, add to, uh, go back to virtue, add to virtue, knowledge. So the second thing is, I'm going to need to be knowledgeable. Uh, uh, somebody ought to touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, the days of having an ignorant church. I, I thought y'all were going to talk to me. Y'all in here looking at me. You might as well talk. Uh, 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 the, uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the days of having an ignorant church are over. Now, this is the responsibility of the believer. Can I ask you a question? How many believers today understand the necessity and the importance of knowledge. I refuse to argue with believers that don't read. I refuse to try to convince believers that I'm right and they're wrong who are not in search of revelation. We have emotional believers today that just want a praise break. All we want to do is, we're not going to pick our Bibles up, and that's why we're hard to preach to, and that's why we don't have no power. We don't have the power of the Holy Ghost because we will not read our Bible. You know why we won't read it? Because we know when we start, it's going to talk to us about us. And right now, I'm in a place, God, and I don't want to hear nothing about me because I'm grown and I want to do whatever I want to do. But he says, oh, if you're going to be strong, you got to add to your moral excellence knowledge. Knowledge. What did Paul tell Timothy? Study. To show yourself approved. That's not just for the preacher. Before you complain about church. Before you complain about work. Before you complain about what's going on in your life. I'm going to ask you a question. How much do you read your Bible? How much do you know? Okay, let me talk to the church. I'm hollering too loud. Let me talk. It's time for us. To stop glamorizing the pulpit. We need people to understand that there is no such thing as a glorified Christian. 
If we are putting all of the pressure of the Bible study on the pastors, we have gotten this thing sadly mistaken. The Bible says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And one way to indicate my hunger is for me to gauge how much do I read my Bible for myself. We come to church on Sundays empty because we've done no maintenance during the week. And we sit on a pew and we say, preach me happy. But if you've been reading that word, that word will preach you happy before you ever get to church. Somebody ought to say, I want knowledge, I want knowledge, I want knowledge. He says, add to virtue knowledge. Now, go to verse number, uh, uh, verse number six. He says, add to knowledge temperance. The third thing I'm going to need, I'm going to need to have self control now there's a difference between moral excellence and self-control moral excellence is about what I do but self-control is about what I restrain myself from doing it's about how well do I manage my anger how well I, I know many of us are upset right now with the racism that's going on and all the other things uh, that have invaded our ranks and the things that are manifesting. But I must add temperance to my knowledge. Once I learn better, I do better. Temperance is self-control. In other words, temperance is a principle that I engage that goes against the agenda of myself. In other words, temperance has to kick in when desire is not diluted. I, 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 let me talk good. Uh, temperance is necessary when desire is present. It's not temperance when it's something you don't want to do and you refrain from doing it. It's temperance when it's something you want to do but you restrain yourself I wanted to choke her but I didn't I, I wanted to cuss him out but I didn't I wanted to go over there to that woman's house but I stayed at home I wanted to pull up that pornography but I turned on T.D. Jakes that's what temperance is and I come to tell you that the more you die to yourself is the more you live unto God Hallelujah. Can I tell three people here that the level of your anointing will be based upon the level of your control? Oh God, I'm preaching good. I'm going to get this tape or something. I need you to understand this. If you want your oil to flow, you got to stop letting your flesh flow. You got to tell your flesh, back up, playboy. You done killed my oil enough. I'm not going to allow you to continue to dominate my thoughts and dominate my actions. And temperance is when I got urges, but I have more of an urgency to serve the Lord. My urgency to serve the Lord will trump my urges and I wonder am I preaching to a church that will lay in the bed and cry before you disobey God because you have temperance somebody ought to say I have self control I have self control I, have, I won't let depression govern me because I have self control I won't let my appetite Come on here. I won't let my appetite govern me. Can I, can I help you here? If you learn self-control, you'll save more money. My proclivities to shock my urges come on here and all of my fetishes to get this that and the other when I develop self control I'll get over that in the name of Jesus now notice here he says add to temperance patience number four I, I gotta I'm going to need to possess endurance now when you look up the word patience uh, that word in its interpretation is endurance somebody say endurance 
Now, patience, ladies and gentlemen, is not waiting. Patience is enduring. Patience is the attitude that you have while you wait. In this context, patience is also being able to withstand hardship. Add to all of these things endurance. You're going to need endurance. There are a lot of people falling by the wayside. There are a lot of people leaving the faith. Uh, there are a lot of people throwing in the towel. Uh, my question is, do you have some endurance? Somebody ought to shout endurance. Uh, can, can you take being talked about and still show up? Uh, can you take being lied to uh, and still show up? Uh, can you deal with a tremendous amount of pressure uh, and still perform and still be faithful and still be dedicated and still be committed. How many people have made up their minds you're going to endure? You're going to endure. Endurance is built up when there is resistance. You, you, you don't know how strong your endurance is until you have to face some resistance. And somebody here, I'm talking to you, the Lord is telling me that it's time for you to show up now and add some endurance to your life. Stop quitting so easy. Stop running so easy. Stop throwing in the towel so easy. Stop stop getting mad and, and blocking people and walking out of people's lives so easy. You need some endurance. Don't quit jobs so easy. Somebody on that job is not going to like you. Stay there anyway. Stop being a nomad because you're being run by your emotions. You're going to need some endurance and then he says not only that you're going to need to add to patience godliness somebody say godliness now what does this mean godliness means i'm going to need to walk in godly reverence godliness is not about me acting deep uh, there are a lot of people confused. You're confused about your faith. You're confused about how to carry yourself as a saint. You think that because you're saved, you got to speak in tongues all the time. And you think you got to be deep. That ain't being godly. Being godly is having godly reverence. In fact, in this particular text, the word godliness is synonymous with the word holiness. And it means to be sacred or consecrated. It means to walk in godly fear. In other words, when I'm, when I'm a godly person, that means who I am it is a representation of my reverence for God. Everything that I do is connected to my fear and my reverence of God. That's what he's saying. When you're godly, you have a godly awareness. That means when you're godly, you do things like pray before you go to bed. When, when you're godly, you do things like uh, acknowledge him before you leave the house. When you're godly, you do things like worship him and you're not even at church. That's what godly people do. When you're godly, before you respond, you begin to deliberate about how you're going to react to something when you're godly when you're godly when you teach words when you're godly he said you gotta add some godliness with your patience you gotta add some godliness with your patience you gotta add some godliness with your patience you, you know this is the thing that we we've got to get back to where we don't have to wear our spiritual t-shirts in order for people to know that we are people of faith people ought to know that there's something different about you just by how you carry yourself and if you got to speak in tongues or you if you have to do something spiritual in order for people to recognize that you are a person of faith you need to check how godly you are 
Because when you're godly, you can do nothing spiritual. When you're godly, I've had moments where I was in settings with other men and probably using just as much street vernacular as they are. But they said, you're a preacher, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I am a preacher. How you know? Because even in my most common state, there are governors. There are invisible governors of think boundaries that I'm not going to cross because I'm godly. You got to be godly. You, you have to be a person where you're in this boundary you're not in prison but you have boundaries hallelujah in fact somebody ought to say I'm freer than I've ever been I'm freer Uh, I'm talking good now I'm freer than I've ever been I'm not bound I'm free to be me and and then notice I'm getting ready to close now notice here uh, in the next verse he says add to godliness brotherly kindness Oh, God, can I go to work? Can I go to work? Let me just say this. Uh, Number six, I'm going to need to be relational. I'm going to need to be relational now that I'm godly because I know a lot of godly people with nasty attitudes. Uh, I know. Notice he said brotherly kindness, not not brotherly love, but brotherly kindness because he is speaking to the context of your personality. I'm going to need to be relational. All of you people who are who are leaning on being uh, introverted and I'm, I'm introverted so I can't fellowship with the saints and uh, I don't know why people think that I'm acting funny when I don't speak. It's not that I'm acting acting funny. I'm just not like that. Oh no, but the Bible says you need to add some kindness boo. Uh, If you see me, you need to speak to me. Yeah, Yeah. you need to add some brotherly kindness. This is the kind of kindness that we give to one another. We've got to be relational. And let me tell you this, no man is an island. You will not survive by yourself. You You won't survive. You won't survive. And let me tell you something. You will know how relational you've been when you go through a storm. If your phone's not ringing and nobody's checking on you, it's not because people hate you. It's just because you hadn't been relational. Hallelujah. Uh, And touch your neighbor, tell him you need to be the initiator. Be the initiator. Stop being the person that folk got to chase you all the time. They they got a big for your phone calls and big for your text messages and big for your handshake. Be relational. Add some brotherly kindness after you finish preaching do you know how to handle me after you finish speaking in tongues and interceding do you know how uh, to treat me do how was your attitude uh, how is uh, how was your functionality with other people we have to get back to practical things in the church even as we get ready to come back to church I want to tell you that it matters how you treat other people it matters it matters it matters and then finally Notice he says, and he distinguishes these two, add to knowledge, add to, uh, rather, brotherly kindness, charity. He says, you're going to need to be loving. Why? Because I can be kind to you and not love you. Because kindness is an action that really does not speak to the context of your heart. So he says, when you show me kindness, make sure that it's from the heart. I need to tell you today, whoever's listening to me, he says, you're going to need to be loving. There's a lot of hate going on in the world. And let me just help all of you right now that you're bothered. Uh, we had another tragic shooting in Atlanta on yesterday. There are a lot of people who are frustrated. Let's not start a war against all white people. Because the war is against racism, not white people. There are a lot of white people that are standing on the sides of black saying black lives matter. 
Let's not be unreasonable, people of God. Let's be understanding. Let's be loving. We have a pastor here. Let me just go here, and I'm going to close. We have a pastor here in our city, in our region, that's under fire because of some likes on Facebook, some likes on Instagram. I know that many of you are bothered, and you have every right to be. But let's not go on an all-out campaign to destroy his ministry. We don't want that church to fail. We want that church to win. Let us pray for him. And I know many saints would argue, but I don't, I don't have anything but book for you. Let's not go trying to tear him down. Let's pray for him. I don't know how you feel about him, but I want him to win. I want him to win. We have to be loving. Now, let me close here. In verse number 8, he says... And I'm over time. For if these things be in you, listen to this. If these things be in you, Daniel, this is what got me when I studied this scripture. If these things be in you, everything, all seven things that I mentioned to you. Here's the most powerful part of this dissertation. He says, and abound. If these things be in you. And abound. You know what that means? And they increase. So he says, everything that you add, you have to add to what you added. If these things be in you, what? The morality, the knowledge, the self-control, the endurance, the godly reverence, the being relational, the being loving. If they be in you and they increase. You shall neither be barren. That means when I'm barren, I have all of the things to produce, but there's no productivity. Nor unfruitful. Same scenario. You will not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. Guess what? There is a separation coming. There's a separation coming. Now I'm closing. There's a separation coming in this last day. The real church from the playing church. The real church is going to abound in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. The real church will be scripture quoting, Jesus believing, saved, sanctified, standard living people. The performing church, they just want attention. They want to use Jesus' platform. To let their flesh be seen. God is sending a line of demarcation. And there, now come on y'all. You put two plum trees beside each other in springtime. One is full of plums and the other, one is, the other is desolate of plums. Everybody will notice that. Same kind of tree, but only one producing you're not going to be able to hide in this next season. If there is no fruitfulness, there will be a distinguishing. He says, you will abound in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number nine. He that lacketh these things, he's blind. He can't see. He had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And verse number 10 Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Listen, I got to go. But did you see verse number nine? He says, if you don't add the, the, the thing that you need, he that does that, he, he that does not do that, he is blind. And he can't see afar off. Now that's an oxymoron. I thought blind people couldn't see. Biblically, blindness is not your inability to see, but it is your inability to see afar off. That means that that believer and that person is only able to behold what's around them. That's why all of their decisions 
are now reflective. They will not make choices for their future. And the scripture says that that man, he's forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. So what does he do? He's saved. He's got the power of God. He's a believer. But he goes back to his old self because he's blind because he refuses to add all seven of these things. Will you lift your hands wherever you are? Will you just release out of your mouth, say, Lord, make me fruitful. Oh, God, I'm over time, but I know I got somebody watching me. If it's nothing but two viewers left, I got enough. Somebody right now, just begin to lift up your voice. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody just lift your hands and say, be fruitful in the name of Jesus. Listen, if you're on this feed, somebody that's watching me, somebody that's watching me, if you've been touched by this word and you're saying to yourself, I want all of those things in my life, but I got to get the first thing right. I, I need to be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. I need to be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. If that's you and you're, you're saying, I want to be saved, I want you to type in the feed one word, salvation. Salvation. If you're watching and maybe you just need prayer and you've got some things before the Lord and you need somebody to agree with you in what you're going through, I want you to type special request. Special request. Special request. Or type exactly what you need. If you are watching me and you're saying, I've been looking for this kind of teaching. I need it in my life. I need it because I want to grow. I want to grow. And you're saying, I've been looking for a church home and I believe I found it. If that's you and you would like to become a member of All Nations Church, I want you to type in the feed the word membership. Staff will be in contact with you in the name of Jesus. I feel God right now. Somebody begin to open your mouth and Open your mouth and Rukama Sita Nanamo Shata. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's a revival taking place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, Zion. Thank you, Lord. You reign upon the throne.
telling you, it blessed my very life. It makes you take the mirror and begin to look at yourself and say, there's something else. I must go deeper. I need more. Hallelujah. And I'm so grateful. Hallelujah. That the word was so impacting. It always is. And today and in this season, that word is what we need. He said, heaven and earth would pass, but his word would stand. So dear people of God, I dare not, after a mighty move of God and after such a powerful word, I dare not let this moment pass without allowing you the moment to sow into the word of God. What a dynamic word. Hallelujah. What a powerful word. I'm telling you right now, take this opportunity and this moment to sow into the house of the Lord. You can text your seed, amen, to 205 632 1129. There are more details and in giving information at the bottom of your stream. I want you to, I want to offer that opportunity to you because this is a time and a season now where we must take the opportunity to sow into God's house, to sow into the word because we know that God is going to do something in us. Hallelujah. He says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And we trust God and we thank him for it. Sow that seed now. Do it now and watch God bless you real good. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we understand, oh God, that as long as we're wrapped in this flesh, oh God, that there's temptation all around us, God. So many desires of the flesh, God. Oh God, but we know, God, that once we submit to your divine will, God, and we yield to the spirit man, oh God, that God, you will take control of our lives, God, and you will lead and guide us, God. You will tear down every high place, God. You will make every crooked place straight, oh God. So God, as the word has fed our very lives, oh God, we ask right now, oh God, that as we go, oh God, that we would implement the word, oh God. That as we go, oh God, we would practice your word, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. It is the word that has come into our lives, God. Now calls that word to be the engrafted word, oh God, in the name of Jesus, God. Now as we prepare to leave this service, oh God, but never from your presence, God. Bless us and be with us. Bless the gifts, oh God, and bless the givers, oh God. Cause us to walk into a wealthy place. Enlarge our territories now. And we thank you and we magnify you for it now. It's in Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen and thank God. People of God, this concludes our service. I pray that you have a blessed and a magnificent Sunday. God bless you all in Jesus' name.